Okay. Um, welcome everybody to um, our first talk in the um, Human Evolution and the Paleolithic Seminar Series uh, this uh, year. And uh, we have a, a nice program this year. And uh, the first talk uh, is by uh, Marta mirason La from the University of Cambridge. Um, I think Marta is probably known to most of you anyway. Um, but uh, Mar Marta is currently a professor for um, human evolutionary biology and prehistory at the University of Cambridge. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah. she's <laughs> worked um, a lot. <laughs> And um, uh, is probably known to uh, most of you for also for her publications uh, on uh, modern human origins. Um, and uh, she always has been also a very keen field worker, I think, <laughs> and um, spending uh, lots of time in Africa uh, generating primary data uh, for all of us in the end. And um, yeah, uh, I'm very happy, Marta, uh, to have you here today. And um, the stage is yours. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Oh, this is so loud. It's very loud. Is it better? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Philip, for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be in Vienna. I had only been to Vienna once before when I was a PhD student that I came to measure things in the museum. So this is great. Okay. I should say uh, um, this is a, a, a sort of human evolution and Paleolithic. I'm not going to mention stone tools. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's a deliberate decision. Uh, the, mm, we have views about the stone tools that go with this story, but we're still working on 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 that. So I will not mention stone tools, which is quite an outrage. Okay, I should also say that mm, it worked before. Yes, I should also say that this talk is is. Uh, not just mine, it's mine and Rob Foley. And as you know, Rob and I are married and we've been working on this for a very long time or on all sorts of things. And we agree on some, disagree on others. And to give you an idea towards the end of the talk, I'll go into something that we worked on in 2004 and never published because we never quite got it finished. Okay, so it's very much a joint talk. So what I thought I'd do today is uh, talk about modern human origins. And I think I haven't given a talk on modern human origins for something like 20 years, partly because we've been busy uh, with a lot of field work and focusing on giving talks on what we're finding in Kenya and Turkana, uh, and partly because the field is in a state of flux. And there's, uh, there's a lot of new genomic evidence uh, for more recent European prehistory. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of evidence, but doesn't expand in equal measure elsewhere, partly because genomes from Africa are not there and so on. So, uh, so I started from scratch with a blank PowerPoint for this. And so I might creak a little bit. Okay, so when I, went to Cambridge to do my PhD, and that's a very, very long time ago. This was pretty much the state of the field. So actually I was doing my master's when the conference in 1987 uh, was discussing multi-regional versus out of Africa. And Chris presented his out of Africa and Milford, who was also at that conference said, no, it's multi-regional. So, the years after this conference, that's the same year of the Carnetal mitochondrial DNA paper. Right? So the years after this were swamped by genetics. First, single loci, uh, the uniparental markers, and then more genetics, and then more genomes, and so on. And they slowly rejected the multi-regional model. And we ended up with an out of Africa, sort of the consensus. So where we are today? here right so today this model obviously no longer holds and we've transformed it into this where we have very different interpretations out there uh, from full reticulation to blending of archaics and humans all sort of involving some level of gene flow and admixture to speciations, to models who say, actually, it wasn't in Africa at all. 
<laughs> we're looking in the wrong continent, right? So we are at a moment in which there is much uncertainty uh, as to what we are talking about. So uh, <laughs> I, I think that a, a recap and, and a rethink, it's timely. Okay, so with exclusion of stone tools, uh, I will talk a little bit about the genetic evidence uh, and with a quick reminder, the genetics and genomics are very powerful. They really are very powerful tools to get onto this. Uh, they can partition the variants in a way that we never could do with morphology. Um, we can make inferences on population size that we never could with morphology and so on. But it does have also its own constraints. And the constraints are multiple. I mentioned already that in Africa, there are very few ancient genomes and others that exist are very, very recent. So we do not have an ancestral African reference genome. And that is affecting a lot of the information. If they didn't leave descendants, we're blind. Uh, there's no geography in any reconstruction of a genetic phylogeny. Right? The geography of some of the people today, and you might infer into the past, but all your nodes have no geography. And there are many different assumptions. I mean, the mutation rates vary uh, substantially so that you can get dates of 150 or 300,000 for the same event. There are assumptions on uh, generation time. There are assumptions on how many admixture events you add to explain the variance and so on. So great system with issues. The fossils, which is my love, uh, it's great. You know, you look at extinct populations, but the truth is that we don't look at extinct populations unless you're down in the SEMA. You look at extinct individuals <laughs> and transforming individuals into populations is a huge issue. Uh, we uh, get adaptation, we get selection, we get behavior. Yeah, but we're still on the fact that it's difficult to transform not only individuals into populations, but what do I do with the gaps? Do I assume a descent? Do I assume no relationship? And so on. I would also say it gives us a time and space stamp for the phenotypes that you're looking at but those phenotypes have a high level of homoplasy. So enough work has been done in, in cladistics to show that just about, if you, at least with early hominins, about 30% homoplasy for all the resolved cladograms. Right? So homoplasy is a real issue. And then I'll talk a little bit, actually before the fossils, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the context, the climatic context. I'm going too slow. Okay. So let's interrogate the genetics system. And I'll ask the first question, does the genetic evidence still support an African origin for our species? And you may have heard, there are some very important uh, researchers right now who think this is no longer the case. So I went back to the basics. So there's a lovely paper published in Cell this year where you're looking at a tree of humans today, and you see the basics of the model, which remains since Canetal did it on mitochondrial DNA. So Africans have more diversity than the rest of the world here in white. The root of that diversity is within Africa, and the diversity outside Africa is a subset. So it's one branch out of the last branch of this tree. So those two things, Africans have more genetic diversity than non-Africans, non-African diversity is nested in Africa. They remain true since Canada. It's also the case that humans, despite that mixture, remain closer to each other than to any archaic. Altogether, I think that we are still firmly with evidence that supports an African origin for Homo sapiens. 
My next question, is there consensus on the timing of human diversification in Africa? So when humans, when human diversity began, in a way, when humans began diversifying. So you say, well, what do the fossils say? The fossils say nothing, right? For the last 300,000 years in Africa, uh, if you exclude Naledi, you must have a dozen fossils less, probably. So the fossils don't inform on this, but the genetics do. And most of these genetics are inferences from living populations, so models, inferences, and this lovely paper by Slebush, including the very recent few uh, African ancient genomes. So what is the outcome? Two possibilities. One, between 100 and 150,000. That would be the age of an early split, usually involving the, the, the Kung and the and Koi, Koi, Koi Kung populations in Southern Africa, the clique speakers of Southern Africa. So, or 250,000 or more. So at the moment, actually there are more, I could have added more to this table and run out of time. Um, so there are two clusters of ages. So either humans began diversifying in the sense that some living populations trace the majority of their ancestry to a population older than 100,000, or a population closer to 300,000. And at the moment, that disparity is there. Does the genetic evidence suggest where in Africa the ancestral population lived? And I've already told you right, that ancest uh, genetic information has no geography in the older nodes. And the answer is a firm no. So, we know there was a paper published in 2019 suggesting the wetlands of South Central Africa as the source. And this paper put a lot of emphasis on the fact of, of the, uh, the Khoisan having a Southern African origin, etc. But the fact that the Khoisan live there today doesn't tell you they lived there 150,000 years ago or their ancestors or the majority of their ancestry, right? So the truth is we do not know where in Africa that ancestral population lived. And as you will see as the talk moves on, the suggestion is that there was more than one ancestral population that merged to create humans. So there's more than one geography involved in the process. So the genetics says there was a structure. What does it mean? Populations were fragmented, spread in space but multiple instances of gene flow among this, within this modern human clade. And there's also, I mark here two events. So one we know very well. So in the last, no, here the top one. In the last five, 6,000 years, uh, domesticates gave a major advantage to certain populations in Africa. So part of the Bantu expansion that domesticated uh, on pl plants and spread, and the other one are the pastoralists that also had a more limited but uh, important dispersal. These populations erased a lot of the structure and assimilated probably with differential uh, survivorship existing hunter-gatherers. So there's a lot of information that's simply not available in Africa today. And it's probably likely that, oh, so that should be a six. There was another large expansion process uh, in the upper Pleistocene. Okay, is there a signature of archaic admixture in Africa? Because in Europe, in Eurasia, we're all talking about archaic admixture, right? Denisovans, Neanderthals, and so on. So is there such a signature in Africa? And the answer is yes. This was discovered first for the Y chromosome, now more than 10 years ago, and it now has been found in most models that to try to explain African diversity. <laughs> so most of these models come up with an answer, like you look here, this 20% here, or these mixtures here, that around 300, 400,000 years ago, the stem, because we don't know if it's one population, two or three, but the stem, that accounts for most of our ancestry, assimilated 
a percentage, they suggest here 20%, uh, became 20% of that ancestral uh, gene pool of something older. How old? Well, in some models, it's very old, more than a million years old. So it's case not dissimilar what we observe in Denisova, where there is a super archaic introgression in the more recent past. If Denisovans are only 400,000 years old, so it has to be in the same time frame. So when did the ancestors of humans and the ancestors of Neanderthals and Denisovans uh, diverge? So there's a lot of genetics I didn't put uh, all of it. There's a lot of genetics I put here, cartoon, where you have sapiens, Neanderthals, Denisovans. This is the topography of this relationship. A deep ancestry, Neanderthals and Denisovans are the sister clade to modern humans. And that ancestry is deeper in the middle Pleistocene than thought at the time of the out of Africa. So we are, the estimates are between 760,000 and 550,000. So we're talking the last ancestor of Neanderthals and humans being more than half a million years old. But that also gives you the time depth of each of those lineages. What was the subsequent contact? You know, we open the journals and there is more dispersals, more admixture and more, more, more integration. Yeah. So what are the contacts deeper in time? I think there's a very important one, still with fuzzy uh, chronological boundaries, that happens sometime after 400 and up to 250, because these are the boundaries in the genetics that African genes are found in the ancestry of Neanderthals to the exclusion of Denisovans. So we have a story in which uh, there's a common ancestor, humans and Neanderthal Denisova. They split. The Neanderthal Denisova moved to Eurasia, split. We'll talk about them, probably East-West, simple allopatry. Uh, and then there is an injection of African sapiens genes that is clearly visible in the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome into ancestors of Neanderthals, but not Denisova. Okay, is there evidence of a sharp bottleneck? This has been suggested, not by who et al. particularly, but not just, there are other people who see this uh, sharp bottleneck around 900,000 years ago. There's been published, well, there's a paper in bioarchives that just went up where they reanalyze the same data, different techniques, various multiple techniques, and they say, actually, there is no, that's an artifact. There was a decline, a demographic decline, but not a sharp bottleneck. I'll, I'll tell you why I, I like that. This, this, I think it's important. However, I mean, these Pleistocene populations are very small. I mean, we're talking populations here, 400 to 1,000 ancestors to the Altai. So, you know, these are tiny populations all through the Pleistocene. Okay, a little summary, and I'll have to read it. So the Af Africa, I think, remains the continent of origin for the majority of modern human ancestry. I say majority because everybody in this room has a small component of non-African ancestry. Human diversification began at least 100, 100 150,000 years ago, probably significantly earlier. Since the origins of the human, the sapiens clade, we have structured populations. So you have to imagine drift, adaptation, multiple instances of gene flow, and superimposed on this expansion events that we don't really have at the moment uh, an archaeological and fossil record to map the extent. We don't know where the ancestral population lived. That should be an either. So there's evidence of gene flow from deep lineages. Neanderthals, Denisovans are the sister group of sapiens, last sharing a common ancestor 
in the early Middle Pleistocene. Neanderthals and Denisovans, I didn't mention, they're thought to have split around 450,000 years ago. After that split, there's evidence of a dispersal of humans that impacted the gene pool of Neanderthals. Uh, Pleistocene populations were very small, very small. And there is some population decline at 900,000, but probably not a sharp bottleneck. So a cartoon that simplifies this story. Point one, this is the origin of a clade and the clade of living people today. Point two, that clade must have had relatives. Some were simulated and some we didn't. And this is happening in the last 300,000 or around 300 or could be between 300 and 400,000 years ago. Point three, Neanderthals and Denisovans split. Point five, I mean, these things have ranges. Remember, these are genetic dates. Genetic dates are huge boundaries. Point four, the sapiens lineage separates from the ancestors of Neanderthals and Denisovans. And point five, presumably, the ancestor of this is separating from something else, at which point we really don't know. Okay, so let's look at the context of this. And I know this slide is a mess. And I made it worse by adding red. Uh, a climate curve, and I did purposely, in purpose, I started way back because you know, the, the trend towards cooling is a long-standing uh, feature uh, of, the, of the Cenozoic. So you get onsets of global glaciation, the Walker circulation, and all this sets the scene for a shift in the orbital influences in our climate. So we have a period called the early to middle Pleistocene transition, and I will not talk much about this because I know Aurélien Mounier said I gave his talk about this, where there are a number of changes, changes in the amplitude, changes in what the length of the orbital cycles that are most impactful, so from 41 to 100,000. So you see the amplitude growing, also you see uh, the pacing of these cycles changing. And this EMPT is a couple hundred, people disagree, uh, a couple hundred thousand years either side of a million. Actually, people say between 1.2 to the beginning of the middle Pleistocene, more or less. Okay, so what do we know in, in Africa about that time? So, Behind these red boxes, this is a very busy slide, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. So in this line here, it's information on whether it's getting colder or hotter. Here we know are the famous, the curves that we all use of, of deep sea cores or ice cores. We have here orbital eccentricity in black, uh, the sapropels, the Mediterranean sapropels. In green, proposed green Sahara events, so moments when the Sahara is crossable. And here we have uh, a slightly, uh, I cleaned it, uh, a curve by Grant et al. that has picked up all proxies that they could find in mostly East Africa, North Africa, but they say it's Pan-African of dryness, levels of aridity. Right at the top, East African lakes, right? So a sort of summary. So what do we see? Before a million, it's wet. It's pretty wet and it's pretty hot. And there are many Green Sahara events. This matters. Every Green Sahara event, you can have an African hominin sitting in the Levant. And we see this in the fauna, these repeated expansions. Critical, this period here. That's why I remarked on the bottleneck story. So Grant et al, they see this massive arid face in Africa. This time, Lake Olorgasaili dries completely 
like a hundred thousand years. So we're talking long term arid conditions, mega drought conditions. It is uh, uh, obviously has an orbital dimension as well. But these are things matters. It matters for our reconstructions and it matters for our understanding of what's going on in Africa. And that is followed by a pretty wet episode. So this is when we're talking the Neanderthal, Denisovan and Sapien split. And then this recurrent, but much less. So there's a continuous, which makes sense. Do you know, we're talking, do you know, the modern humans, there's modern human DNA in Neanderthals at 300,000. There is a Pedima in Greece at 200,000. There's Mislia in the Levant at 160,000. There's Kul and Kapse at 130,000. There's humans, in, yeah, look, it's all wet. They're going in out again and again and again and again and again. But before, it's very dry. So you have these actual cycles that are not the 100,000 year glacial cycles we've all been talking about, but are cycles of aridity and wetness that affect how often you can cross the Sahara and in here, how you survive uh, in Africa. Okay. So in terms of the fauna, Apologize because I can't build this bit of the fauna yet for various reasons. It's complicated. There are very few middle Pleistocene sites in Africa. So there's a lot of uncertainty on faunas here. But what can we tell? So there's a set of animals that characterize uh, old faunas of Africa. Uh, and they're characterized by very large individuals. Do you know, they're not just large, in, large or species of large animals, but the individuals in those species are particularly large. Uh, and then after, have, I have to, uh, between 400 and 300,000, there are issues with the data. But uh, the last time we pick up, those giant animals, like, you know, the large-bodied Paleoloxodon reki, the Echozoldivayensis, the Gorgops, Hippos, uh, and so on, it's around, it's after half a million years ago. So we have a fauna turnover in East Africa. It's, we're working on the rest of the continent, is not clear. Where these very large archaic species, they get replaced, by species that are actually more ecologically tolerant, uh, they're smaller in body size, and so on. Uh, so you have now Loxodonta africana, for example, Ecus grevi, grevi zebras, hippo amphibios, and so on. The disappearance, so a turnover, this was published by Tyler Faith and colleagues, and. So but this turnover is not black and white. So the extirpations, the disappearances locally of particular species is complex, right? And some of the old taxa survive in pockets. Again, do you not think that lady? <laughs> let's think, tra let's transfer this to humans. We are seeing the same. Okay. Uh, also, we have taxa that buck the trend. They're just not doing the same as everything else. And we also have some East South Africa clear exchange of taxa. Okay. I want to look at the fossils. So I'm going to jump a little bit and go and say, okay, so we have this cartoon, we have this particular moment. What does the fossil record, the hominin fossil record tell us? And I'll start with a list, and then we'll ask a few questions. So if we think in the EMPT, so this period uh, uh, of major climate change that encompasses the aridity, the mega drought, and so on, we actually have so little. But let's see what we have. So we have a set of crania uh, around a million years old, uh, and one a little bit younger, which is interesting. And we also have uh, some postcrania, particularly both Gona and Buya have these pelvises. 
and OH28. It's also the time when we last see Habilis and Paranthropus. So the lab, the last appearance in the datum at Swarcrans member three. Uh, I put an asterisk there because some of you have been reading Zanoli and colleagues who say Paranthropus does not go extinct. And we have uh, in the mandibles at Capturin and possibly in Aledi. Uh, very late paranthropines. Okay, so it's just a note. I'm not going to go there. Okay, so now in the middle Pleistocene, so younger than 800,000, what do we have? We have a tooth. I'll tell you why I bothered for well, this tooth. It's an isolated tooth, it's a lovely tooth. Uh, we have some calvaria, the cranium of Bodo. Those my the capturing <laughs> complicated, uh, Thomas querying due to etc. Interesting stuff with no date, and then we also have footprints in Ethiopia. Interesting here we're talking now fossils, South Africa, East Africa, and the Maghreb. So it's a different geography in here. Um, please note some of this, which is quite quite extraordinary. Uh, we'll come back to talk a little bit about them. And then in the last 400,000 years, so we split the middle Pleistocene, what do we have? And I think that we have very distinct things. So we have on the one hand, fossils that look like this lot, right? And in there, I would put, for example, Cabwe, right? That now has a date of 300,000. Uh, I would put the femur from Kubifora, it's in there. You'd say, well, why not Eli Springs? Because we don't really know the date. Um, why not? I mean, we could put other things, but they have really dubious. People say, Womde, why not Womde? Womde is completely dis it's distorted. I mean, we cannot make anything out of that morphology yet. Okay, we also have fossils that have phonetic affinities to Homo sapiens, Jebeli Hoot, Galoba, Floris Bad, and so on. We have fossils of Homo sapiens. Right? Kivish, one and two, Herto, and younger. And then we have fossils of Naledi. Right? The Naledi is the most extraordinary, fabulous set of discoveries. It's an archive that is unparalleled. We're talking, and I understand this has already grown, more than 15 individuals. Uh, they are very recent. They're very, very, very homogenous. Very homogenous. Uh, they're all, they're very small. So in height, not that small, in height would have been here, but 39 kilos. I'm not going to say a kilos anyway. Uh, they come from different chambers. They have strange behaviors and they have extraordinarily uh, mixed mosaic of morphologies. We're talking more than 190 teeth over 1,500 specimens, so extraordinary. And what I should say, I know people have had major criticisms about this team because of some of the things they say. Now, all the materials published, it's extraordinary. They publish everything. So they don't sit on the fossils for a long time. Then, like I said, Eli Springs, Wonder, Salé is thought to be uh, pathological, so I left all that out. Okay, let's ask our questions. Does this record inform on the origins of modern humans? That has to be our first one. Okay. So who was the last common ancestor of humans, Neanderthals, and Denisovans? So remember I said 765 to 555, that's the genetic estimate. So it could be older than 750, older than 550, but it's older than more than a uh, half a million years. This is what we have to choose from in Africa at the moment. So we have morphologies that are utterly different. These are the same age. I'll go here. Morphologies, so these are 1 million. This is 850 extraordinarily robust, thick skull. Completely different. This is superimposed on the head of Kabwe, which is the best fit. This is the material from Gombore. Then we have Lance Fontaine and Bodo that have changed, you know, these massive faces. Compare these massive faces with those. 
But then I want to highlight this one is 900,000 years old, comes from Olorka Sile, southern Kenya, and it's tiny. It's actually smaller than some Naledi. I want to point out this here. This is a, a pelvis from Ghana in, in Ethiopia. And this pelvis, it's not only very small, the ilia flare out, and it has the closest, like an australopithecine morphology, right? But very small, we're talking a very small uh, person. In comparison, you have here a pelvis from Olduvai or H28 and a pelvis from Buya that are telling us of really large people that probably weigh, you know, 60, 70, 80 kilos. So what do we make of this? Well, somewhere there, we might have a representative of the population ancestral to us and, and Neanderthals. We don't know. But what we do know is there's more than one group. And we do know that there are small-bodied hominins in the early middle Pleistocene of East Africa as well. And the tooth, Nadunga, fits in there. It has really primitive features, lovely, but, and it's tiny. Okay. You know, I'm in trouble for even asking this question with a number of people. Are the, are the ancestors of Neanderthals and Denisovans in Africa? So if the first population that gives rise to the sapiens lineage, that I think the genetics tells me they're continue to evolve in Africa, separates from the ancestors of Neanderthals and Denisovans, so if that happened in Africa, then the first level of ancestry to the Neanderthals and Denisovans is also in Africa. No? So at least we should at least ask that question. Okay, I do not have an answer and I don't want to get into mega trouble, but I'll put out two models for this. So model one, if the Neanderthals and Denisovans separated from each other as they dispersed into Eurasia, so one went west and one went east. That happens around 450,000 years ago. So we have a minimum of 100,000 years, a maximum of nearly 300,000, 200,000 years in which they would be in Africa. Could be that that is picking up north versus sub-Saharan Africa. It could be that that's picking up some of that African variation, etc. Another model, and these don't have answers, but I think that we have to frame the possibilities. Another model is that the Neanderthals and Denisovans, they separate uh, in Eurasia, but way after the dispersal. So they have some origin, they disperse into the Levant or wherever, and they split without, they don't know, they don't split yet, then they stay. So let's say that's a, a 550 or 750. They get to the Levant and they split. They, oh, sorry, they do not split. And then we have to ask, okay, so where are they? Where would they be? Would they be in the Levant? So do we have such population ancestral to both in the Levant? Would they be in Europe? In Europe, there's antecessor. And I, I fail to find at the moment room for antecessor, which also puts me in trouble. Um, and also, if they split at 450, but we don't have Denisovans, presumed Denisovans in Tibet or the new Chinese fossils, that, or the new interpretations of Chinese fossils, that go maximum depth of 300. So where are they in between? So where are they sitting, right? So there are many questions outstanding about this. And are the populations that contributed to the sapiens ancestral gene pool in the African fossil record? And this is some, uh, the best uh, preserved. So here we have Kivish one and two. And here we have everything, or a range of the, of the fossils at this time, from Naledi 
to Kabwe to Hood. And I would say there are strong contenders, strong candidates for this ancestral population. Irhud, Florisbad, LH18, Ngaloba, uh, that have incipient morphological features of sapiens, but not the whole package. The whole package is a bit minimal, but anyway. And my interpretation is that what you have is that between 400 and 300,000, you do have the evolution of some novelty. We'll come to that. There's a demographically expansive dimension to this population. They spread across regions of Africa. We don't know which. They include extending all the way to Western Eurasia and influencing the Neanderthal genomics, modern technologies. Um, and uh, Sorry, it's a joke. And then subsequent, they fragment. Remember, it's that period where it's not wet yet. They fragment, and then they remix. These populations remix and form the clade and that metapopulation that I think Ellie has described very nicely. There are less obvious creatures around at that time, right? So neither Kabwe nor Naledi are likely ancestral uh, Con contributors to our ancestry. So let's go back to the models. Do we need an extended time frame? My answer is yes. Uh, somewhere in this space, we have we share a common ancestor with Neanderthals and Denisovans. So rather than think in the moment of split, think the moment before. There is a gene pool in Africa that will give rise to these both large-bodied, large-brained, behaviorally complex, capable of rapid expansions, not sustainable until later Homo sapiens, right? But the Neanderthals are also going boom, 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 right? Uh, so there is a population that splits here and evolves right there. The record in Africa is telling us there is so much diversity. Yes, but I think that we're picking up the fragmentation of hominins in that very stressful moment at the end of the early middle Pleistocene transition. And it's who, it's who survive those moments. Imagine the amount of drift, the amount of change that generates on the one side that last common ancestor with us and Neanderthals and Denisovans, but also ancestors of things we know survived, Naledi, and so on. Uh, so more than one lineage of Homo across this period. I would argue that the demographic history is indeed very complex, and this is one of the amazing things we've gained since the Out of Africa multi-regional debate. So just taking two papers, we could you know, deconstruct all these studies. So here we have Bergstrom et al, and it's a beautiful paper. Uh, and they produce this summary that includes fossils and the sort of topology of genetic relationships. So here they put Buya in Eritrea, that one of those one million. And said, well, why, why that one? Why not the other one? Right? They're all very different. So one million, the last common ancestor of humans and a super archaic. Remember what I said, you know, before our last common ancestor with Neanderthals, etc. Presumably we split from some other African, right? So they're putting that at one million, we're in that mega drought space from that super archaic. Then a long period here, mega drought, and then the last common ancestor of ourselves, Neanderthals and Denisovans, and then the split of the two lineages. I said, well, where was this? Which fossils match this? And I insist that we look at the sort of poor African record, because there are very few, with a very simplified notion. We're expecting to find modern human ancestors, and we're finding all sorts of stuff. And some of that stuff could even be ancestors of Neanderthals. And then we have the question of how white populations coalesced to form 
the human ancestry. Okay, we have here a lovely study by Cousins et al. It's still in bioarchives, I checked, in which I said, well, there is actually a bottleneck at the, at the, at the source of the majority of modern human ancestry. And then around 300,000 years ago, this 20% introgression of really ancient genes of a population older than a million. So who would that be? And what are we talking about? What is the process that created that? Um, how much reticulation? So I think reticulation did happen. I think you had reticulation, particularly in the last 300, 350,000 years. It's the pattern. I think it wasn't continuous, so it wasn't reticulated for the last million equally. Population, so a meta population that survives through time and mixes at different extents. And I think it was probably not Pan African, because I don't think that the human ancestry assimilated all the diversity that's in Africa 300,000 years ago, including Kabwe, Naledi. So, uh, and I would also remind those very small hominins out there. So then, Let's tackle a big one. Could the last common ancestor not have been in Africa at all? So be true, all I said about the genetics of living Africans and so on. But let's assume that they came into Africa 300,000 years ago. Can we rule it out? My answer is no. Can we demonstrate it? My answer is also no. Uh, so we have... 130, 140, we have modern humans and non-modern humans, right? Nesha Ramla in the Levant. We have uh, things that are more modern human than not in the Levant. But what do we have there at 700,000, at half a million, that would suggest that the ancestry is actually outside and they come into Africa? I'm also reluctant because I think that biogeographically, the fauna point to directionality in the movement of dispersals. So it gets wet, it gets hot. Eurasian fauna and flora migrate north. Sub-Saharan African fauna and flora migrate north. And the green Sahara, we have lovely records for the Holocene greens from south to north. And what the the uh, studies, I mean, Chernov started this many years ago, shows that Af it's African fauna that reach the Levant and not the other way around. So I actually think there's an inbuilt uh, directionality in the dispersals. Okay. Chris has been telling me. A new paper on Yungshao, or our new paper, Yungshan, uh, in bioarchives. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I have time to discuss this. It's so complex. So the same thing as with Harbin, they're doing extremely sophisticated morphological analysis that result on humans and Denisovans assisted groups to the exclusion of Neanderthals. These, they, are, they are getting these, these results from very different analysis and different data sets. And they even have now antecessor as the ancestor for that clade to the exclusion of Neanderthals. So if this is correct, then forget everything I said today. <laughs> Just about, I mean, we have a different pattern. So human origins are somewhere in probably Eurasia. Um, there's a split with the ancestors of Denisovans quite late after the ancestor of Neanderthals has split and so on. My Issue is that genomorphologies are homoplasic. You know, we've all read about, uh, you know, the baboons and the mangabees, right? And we had classified all the long snouted baboon papionins together and the mangabees together only to run the genomes and find that the black crested mangabee goes with these baboons and the mandrills go with those, those other mangabees. Right? So 
We have a problem. I'm, I'm myself a morphologist, but morphologists have inbuilt homoplasis in there. So at the moment, very flux regarding uh, that those Eurasian middle Pleistocene affinities. Okay, I will run over two minutes. Are humans the result of a speciation of it? So in the original out of Africa, a speciation event was part of the claim. Right? There's an speciation event in Africa, then expansion, replacement of all our cakes. Now we know there isn't complete replacement of all our cakes. So are we still talking a speciation event? And there's a lovely paper by, by Menegan Zin et al. And they said, yes, we still believe there's a speciation event at the core of the origins of sapiens. And it's worth reading. I tend to agree with them. I think that humans actually have differences in their life history, in the rate of growth, uh, in the in the P4 deposition that, that tells us about actually uh, inbuilt rhythms in our body that are unique. And that gives us a unique <laughs> a unique niche a nutritional niche, a unique growth niche, a unique life history niche. I think that they are, uh, that also goes with aspects of our cognition and language that are different, whether, you know, the role of Fox P2, yes or no, et cetera, but there are differences. And while we focus on the skulls, because that's what we have in the fossils, it's very little that it is, is expressed in the skulls of early modern humans. We're talking the globular cranium that might be related to aspects of growth and, and the chin. I would also add to that that there's clear evidence of negative selection on Neanderthal, so the Neanderthal gene deserts, right? So we took Neanderthal genes, we simulated it Neanderthal individuals, but then we cleaned up bits of our genome that have Neanderthal signatures. So I think actually that overall, yes, there probably is a speciation event in that record, but not an event. So this is what Ruben and I started working 20 years ago and never finished. Uh, exploring speciation as a process rather than an event. And as you all know, there's so many different definitions of species. There are actually 26. Uh, but I picked on this because these are what we did, because we think those are the most interesting ones. And rather than being alternative definitions of what makes a species, we think that they are complementary along a process. And we would argue that this speciation eventually does become a cladogenetic event, but when you zoom in, is a process of decreased reticulation. And that it goes through a series of thresholds. So you have a last common ancestor, you have a lopatry. Eventually, if you have a lopatry, you have division, you have drift, you have apomorphies. Then you might evolve really unique novel adaptations if you're lucky and successful. And eventually, some, not all, will go through reproductive isolation. And I think that each of these thresholds reflect what those different definitions of species are telling us that matters in the process of speciation. And I actually think there is no rule in any one lineage at how frequent those are or how spaced those are so that you might have Moments in which you have a low patri and you pass one threshold where you have very small population sizes and then you have apomorphies where you have, and you know, you might get to reproductive barriers or not. So speciation as a long-term process, imagine that if you can collapse the more, you can have it really short too, uh, rather than an event. So we would argue that if we're thinking about modern human origins, we're thinking about multiple transitions. A first transition somewhere out there 
between 750,000 and a million or more, right? So all transitions, uh, when there are many multiple lineages uh, where you have some huge diversity and archaic, and it's probably a moment in which a lot of the old diversity uh, of uh, hominins eventually disappears, partly because of these climate extremes that happened at the time. A second transition, which is I think when our lineage and the lineage of Neanderthals, Denisovans is split and we set different trajectories. So there's enough in common that people have put all this material inside Homo heidelbergensis and so on. So there's enough in common, body size, brain size, trends, etc. But there are also major differences in life history, uh, expansiveness, demographic expansiveness, language, etc. And a third transition, which I think is not an event, is a process, is the process that created us, our diversity, uh, and by assimilating, moving, drifting, moving. But that process, that high reticulation process, I think is right towards the end. So I leave that there as a summary of what we've said. Huge advances in the last three decades. We have a very complex landscape now of models and data. Uh, I still think the origins are in Africa and that the dispersals are out of Africa. There's not one dispersal. I think there's multiple dispersals. I think the past is full of small populations that are subject to drift. That generates a structure. The survivorship of separate contemporaneous lineages. So we shouldn't look at the record of the last million years and expect to find one evolving lineage. I'm talking about Africa. I think this is also the case in China and many other places. We should expect diversity. Some facts, a deep split to African and Eurasian lineages, complex and prolonged extirpations. There will be some little places where something is still alive. Well, not anymore, but was then, right? Complex extirpations. In Africa, not all the hominins in the last million would have been ancestors to our gene pool. A pattern of decline in reticulation, despite that mixture. And the origins of sapiens is not the last step, but that extended process. And yes, the genetics is fabulous, gives us frameworks, gives us hypotheses, gives us topologies. But we need the fossils, we need the paleosciences to actually give shape to the story. Okay, and with that, thanks to Philip and Tom for the invitation. Thanks to Rob, who's not even watching. Uh, a lot of this work happens in discussions uh, in Turkana, so our place there, inspiring human beings and all the people that fund us. Thank you very much.